Um, my name is uh, Rosemary Eldridge. I'm the director. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's here in person. More about the Thomistic Institute for those who aren't familiar with the organization, as well as get the formal for Professor Bauerschmidt. Thank you. The Thomistic Institute is an academic institute of the Dominican House of Studies here in Washington, D.C. Um, among other things, our work is to assist college students in organizing. DI has or will have sponsored more than 100 lectures on 50 different campuses, uh, mostly here in the United States, also up here in England and Ireland as well. Uh, most of these lectures including the one you will hear tonight, um, can be heard through the Thomistic Institute podcast. Um, our speaker is uh, Frederick Christian Bauerschmidt, a professor of theology at Loyola University, Maryland, and a permanent deacon of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Um, his public an introduction, um, as well as uh, articles on Catholic life and thought. Um, he holds University of the South, an MAR from Yale Divinity School, and a PhD uh, from Duke University. Um, in the spirit of Graham Greene's extremely colorful life, I will also share a few details of color from Professor Bauerschmidt's life uh, that I found on the internet, and perhaps uh, he can explain during the reception. Uh, according to Amazon.com, Professor Bauerschmidt has worked in a seafood processing plant in Alaska, hitchhiked from British Columbia to East Tennessee, and once slept under a bridge in Germany. Uh, in more recent years, Amazon tells us he has led a quiet life. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Professor Bauerschmidt. Um, yeah, we can talk about the fish, we can talk about the bridge um, afterwards. So thank you uh, to the Thomistic Institute um, and to the Catholic Information Center. Uh, this is uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. And I will, um, I hope we'll have plenty of time for, for conversation and questions, both maybe formally right after the talk, but then maybe more informally. Um, so my topic tonight is freedom in the novels of Graham Greene, and I'm not presuming I read the novels I'm talking about, so part of what I'll do is give you the basic outline of the plots, and I hope this doesn't degenerate simply into storytelling, um, but I hope that we'll learn something about the nature of uh, Christian freedom. Now, when on the matter of human freedom in relation to divine grace. Uh, it might make sense to begin our search with the Dr. Grazier to look for Augustine's definitive statement on grace and freedom in his late and occasionally dyspeptic controversial works directed at the Pelagians. But I think a better starting point uh, is Augustine's Confessions. In this work, Augustine more or less invents the, a narrative display. Respectively, making this or that life choice is seen retrospectively as always already enfolded within the workings of divine grace. The richness and complexity of what is shown via the narrative rendering of Augustine's life is, I would argue, somewhat flattened out under the pressure of controversy in his late anti-Pelagian writings, seeming at least at times, in some people's eyes, to resemble a distinctly unattractive determinism. Now, I don't actually think Augustine is a determinist, and I don't think his position on freedom is significantly different in the Confessions than in the uh, anti-Pelagian treatises, but what is different is the genre. The relationship of God's grace and our freedom 
is, uh, and therefore the nature of authentic human freedom, is more readily shown than stated, and is perhaps best shown in a narrative. It is narrative that allows a display of the interaction of individual choice, particular circumstances, and final end that's needed for a fully rounded account of human freedom. And this Augustine achieves with remarkable success, I think, in the Confessions. At this point, however, I want to leave Augustine behind and look at the work of another crafter of narratives, the English novelist Graham Greene. What I hope to show is he explores, among other things, the nature of freedom, and that in these novels he shows us something about the nature of authentic and inauthentic freedom. Though Green was shortlisted for the Nobel Prize during his lifetime and wrote novels that attracted both popular and literary acclaim, memory of him has, as is always the case with human achievement, perhaps somewhat dimmed in the decades since his death in 1991. Permit me a few words of introduction to, to Green. Now, given this venue, I should at the outset acknowledge that Green was a famously bad Catholic. He converted to Catholicism as a young man in 1926 before marrying his wife Vivian, whom he met when she wrote to correct him on a point of doctrine in something that he had written that it But once his conversion was genuine, not simply a matter of convenience, it was based more on an intellectual problem. Green and Vivian eventually separated and were for many years estranged, though never divorcing. Uh, he was involved in a number of sexual liaisons both prior to and following the separation long duration. But Green was a man of paradox. Later in life, he took to calling himself a Catholic agnostic, while at the same time speaking in favor of the discipline of priestly celibacy and observing himself the church's discipline regarding Holy Communion, sporadically attending Mass while, as he put it, self-excommunicating himself because he knew he could not make the firm amendment of purpose necessary for a good confession. A reflection of his letters sums up traditions, uh, describing him as, quote, a stranger with no shortage of calling cards, devout Catholic, lifelong adulterer, pulpy hack, canonical novelist, meticulously disciplined, deliriously romantically cynical, activist, strict salon communist, closet monarchist, civilized to a stuffy fault and louche to the imperialist crusade, post-colonial parasite, self-excoriating and self-aggrandizing, to name just a few. So that is probably a better summary than I could ever give. Now, Green always described himself somewhat coyly as a novelist who was Catholic rather than a Catholic novelist, perhaps meaning to suggest that he made no to be expounding Catholic doctrine in his stories. But in three novels in the middle of his career, often described as his, quote, Catholic trilogy, he staked a claim to being one of the most compelling modern depictors of the Catholic faith as a living reality in the hearts of flawed human beings. And central to that complex reality is the question of the nature of freedom. In The Power and Glory, published in 1940, he depicts the church in a situation of political unfreedom in Latin America, but more importantly, he shows how God works through the choices and sometimes the failures to choose of one priest. In the heart of the matter, published in 1948, he explores how one might freely choose 
against one's highest good. And in The End of the Affair, published in 1951, he looks at how God makes one saint a leap of faith, describe the, the bare outlines of the plot, and try and interlace that uh, with comments that will highlight the theme of freedom. So first, the power and the glory. So the first novel in Green's Catholic trilogy, The Power and the Glory, grew from his own experience in Mexico in the aftermath of the Cristeros Revolt, when the church was de facto outlawed in many areas of the country. So this would have been in the late 1930s. Green claimed that his conversion to Catholicism had been largely an intellectual one and a kind of an intellectual wage. And, it was, and he says it was only when he visited Mexico in 1938 that he began to understand the affective dimension of faith. It was the profound tenacity puzzle, something upon which one staked one's life in very concrete ways. In a 1983 interview, he said, when one has been with believers who suffered for their faith, the masses said in secret in Tapas and Tabasco, where there are no longer either churches or priests, this endowed the church with such grandeur, the fidelity of the believers assumed such proportions that I couldn't help but be profoundly moved. Green sets his novel in a slightly, slightly fictionalized version of the Mexican state of Tabasco, where the vehemently anti-clerical government has outlawed the Catholic Church, for, forcing priests either to leave the state or to marry and give up priestly ministry. The last priest serving in the state is the so-called whiskey priest, a classic Green protagonist who wanders anonymously and aimlessly from place to place, impelled to by his sense of duty, his alcoholism, and his guilt over having a child with his housekeeper five years earlier and a single night of despair and drink-induced lust. As he wanders, dressed in the clothes of a peasant, he reflects on how had gradually fallen away, carelessly abandoned. To quote Green, the years were littered with surrenders. The feast days and fast days and days of abstinence had been the first to go. Then he had ceased to trouble more than occasionally about his breviary and finally left it behind at the port in one of his periodic attempts to escape. The routine of his life, like a dam, was cracked and forgetfulness came dribbling through, wiping out this and that. The whiskey priest says mass only rarely, partly because of the difficulty of obtaining wine in the prohibitionist regime of the state, partly out of scruples over celebrating the sacrament in a state of mortal sin, since there is no other priest to hear his confession, but largely out of fear of being caught in and identified as a priest. In his wanderings, he encounters various characters whom Green identifies as the bystanders, an expatriate not-so-pious children, and the young English girl who shelters him briefly at her father's banana plantation and confides in him that she lost her faith when she was The whiskey priest also encounters a mestizo who seems to know intuitively that he is a priest and whom the priest intuits will try to betray him. As a protagonist, the whiskey priest is hardly a man of action. Indeed, he seems buffeted by events, entirely reacting to the decisions of others. Yet in spite of his weakness and his failures, his vacillation, despite stripped of so many of the good, he remains a compelling character because he retains a profound sense of priestly 
Green gives a scene early in the book in which the priest is by the young girl who gave him temporary shelter. Why doesn't simply renounce his faith? He replies, quote, it's impossible. There is no way. I'm a priest. It's out of my power. The child listened intently. She said, like a birthmark. Well, the priest explains, it doesn't matter so much my being a coward and all lieutenant who is pursuing him. The lieutenant is everything that the whiskey priest is not. He's disciplined and dedicated and willing to do whatever is necessary to achieve his version of the kingdom of God, an atheist utopia in which the poor are fed and educated and free. A secular ascetic, the purity of his intent is shown as he looks at a group of children. Green writes, he would eliminate from their childhood everything which had made him miserable, all that was poor, superstitious, and corrupt. They de deserved nothing less than the truth, a vacant universe and a cooling world, the right to be happy in any way they chose. He wanted to begin the world again with them in a desert. The lieutenant's idea of freedom is a strikingly modern one. Freedom requires wiping away the past, returning the world to the bare state of nature so as to begin again. The state of nature might be thought of, as Rousseau would have it, as the realm of the noble savage, or, as Hobbes thought, a life that was nasty, brutish, and short, or, as is most often the case, some mishmash of the two. But the key, the key to the lieutenant's utopia was the devout belief that there is nothing about our world nothing about ourselves that cannot be changed if we so choose. No mark of a past choice that can be indicated, nothing that permanently marks us. The only truly free world is one that we create for ourselves, ex nihilo. The lieutenant embarks on a campaign of taking hostages in villages and executing them if it turns out that the priest has been in that village. Convinced that he is now doing more harm than good, the whiskey priest makes his way across the border to a neighboring state, where the church is still outlawed but not actively persecuted. He is able to celebrate mass in relative safety and receives the deference from others that he had earlier enjoyed as a parish priest. But after only a couple of days, the mestizo appears in the village and tells him that an American criminal, mortally wounded by the police, I thought I'd see Oh, you don't know how the time can slip by. Do you know, I suddenly realized that I was the only person. For a man of action, like the lieutenant, this sounds like a description. It would have only needed a little self-restraint and a little courage. It felt like someone who had been by seconds at an appointed place. In his last thought, Green has the whiskey priest echo the French Catholic novelist Léon Blois. He knew now that at the end there was Math of the story, however, suggests that the priest may not have been handed in approaching God. The various bystanders that the priest encountered are revisited, and Green indicates. 
notes the effect that their brief encounters with the whiskey priest had upon them. Think glimmer of faith reawakened, reassessed, a child inspired by a heroic witness. The novel ends with a new of the pious woman's house seeking shelter and hired by or lets the whether this new priest is a good brave or freedom and unfreedom. What the lieutenant understood to be actions taken in the name of humanity was spirit. What seemed to the whiskey priest to be aimless wandering was, in the mysterious economy of grace, the sowing of the seeds of the world. The lieutenant sought freedom through the exercise of human will, while the whiskey priest found freedom in surrendering his own will to the demands of his priestly ministry. The second novel in Greek mythology is The Heart of the Matter, in which we can encounter something even more mysterious than sanctity, the ability of freely choosing damnation. How could someone knowingly reject God the highest good? What would have to take place within the human heart in order for one to choose to act in a way that one believed sincerely would exclude them from eternal happiness? Set in an unidentified West African British colony, probably based on Sierra, during the Second World War, the protagonist of the heart of the matter is the police officer Henry Scobie, who has been in Africa for 15 years. Scobie is settled into life in the colony, but is pained by the palpable unhappiness of his wife Louise, who is lonely and excluded from the small community of colonials. Scobie and Louise are united by their grief over the death of their only child, a daughter who died some years earlier, yet are separated by their inability to speak to each other about it. Louise longs to leave and go to South Africa, where she has friends. Scobie, borrowing money from an unscrupulous merchant, books her passage, and she departs for a stay of undetermined length. In her absence, Scobie meets a young British woman, Helen Rolt, a ship torpedoed by a German U-boat and attacked that killed her newlywed husband. Scobie is, is initially moved by pity for Helen, who seems even more alone than he is, but before long in a surreptitious love affair. Scobie, a Catholic, knows the wrongness of his actions, but somehow tries to justify it, sometimes, sometimes in the name of pity. When his wife, Louise, from South Africa, he attempts to break off his affair with Helen, but fears that if he does so, she will lose her will to live, or in meaningless sexual encounters seeking solace. He likewise fears if he leaves Elizabeth, leaves uh, Louise for, for Helen, she will be shattered. Moreover, he takes seriously the permanent nature of the vows he made to her when they were married. As he sees it, quote, two people was in his hands, and he must learn to juggle with strong nerves. He sees himself as having no other choice. Love and pity hold him bound. The struggling act, however, is made much more complicated on a profoundly metaphysical level by the newly 
Louise's request to Mass and receive communion together, a sign of her renewed dedication to their marriage. Scobie knows that if he refuses her request, she will become suspicious, so he attempts to go to confession to rid his soul for receiving the But he cannot repent the love he feels firm purpose of amendment since he believes to abandon Helen would be to condemn her to damn himself. Serve. Unlike the lieutenant in the power and the glory of himself as supremely radically free, Scobie understands himself to be chained by his love and pity and his sense of responsibility. And kneels at the altar rail, Green writes, he made one last attempt at prayer. O oh God, I offer up my damnation to you. Take it. Use it for them. And was aware pale, papery taste of an eternal sentence on his tongue. Caught between two women whom he loves, or at least pities, and convinced that he has already been put beyond the scope of God's mercy, Scobie sees no solution except his own death. For once he is dead, he tells himself, both Helen and Louise will be able to move forward and rebuild their lives. He thinks, I can't desert either of them while I'm alive, but I can die and remove myself from their bloodstream. They are ill with me, and I can cure them. He kills himself he's attempting to make it feel no guilt. His wife suspects the truth. And when she speaks to her parish priest about Scobie's act, even Scobie might not be beyond the reach of God's mercy. He says, the church knows all the rules, but it doesn't know what goes on in a single human heart. I think from what I saw of him, he really loved God. Readers of the heart of the matter moved in particular by the final words of the priest, have seen Scobie as a tragic figure, trapped in circumstances that deprive him of freedom and forced into a horrific choice, but one that is born out of love, love both of God, speaking about the relationship of author to character, Green noted, their relationship is so ambiguous that characters come to elude his control as with Scobie in the heart of the matter, one doesn't know whom to blame. Green came to feel that Scobie, in a sense, out of his authorial control, he should have been. He wrote in one of his memoirs, the character of Scobie was intended to show that pity can be the expression of an almost monstrous pride. While we might think of pride as a damnable sin, we tend to see pity as more admirable. And we see Scobie's final despair to be the outcome of his love and pity. But can genuine love actually engender despair? But it's not, it's, it's not despair itself a form of pride. wrote, Despair spurns God's mercy by considering one's sinfulness greater than God's goodness and mercy. This is why it is, in her eyes, the one sin that can lead to hell. But many of Green's readers miss the element of pride in Scobie, his arrogant assumption that two different women could not live without his love, that the very idea of a world with him in it but not in their possession, would be intolerable, even deadly to them. 
he masks the vice of pride behind a screen of supposed virtues, love, pity, duty, in order to convince himself that the path he has chosen is one about which he has no choice, is even a kind of noble sacrifice for others. He masks the freedom of his choice for himself, from himself and apparently from many of the readers of the novel as well. Perhaps this is simply a failure of Green's narrative art. Or, and this is what I tend to think, it might be a testimony to the complex web of knowing self-deception that would have to be involved to freely abandon God for the sake of our own self-importance. For such self-deception is one of the most complex exercises of human freedom in which we willingly subvert our own knowing of the good that is connatural to us. Perhaps the tendency that we have to misread Scooby is in fact Green's success in getting his readers to engage in their own form of self-deception, to enact in themselves the same play of pride and pity that is Scooby's undoing. Now, the third novel that I'd like to talk about is The End of the Affair. It might be the best known of these three because there was a, about 10 years ago, a semi-popular movie made of it. I'll speak briefly about the plot because the plot is, in fact, a fairly simple one, and it's the shortest of the three novels. Um, this is the one of the three novels where the narrator is actually a character within the novel. While the two are engaged in a tryst at Bendrix's house, there is, an, uh, there is an air raid, and a bomb destroys the house. Finding what appears to be Bendrix's lifeless body in the rubble, Sarah, who up to that point seemed to be bereft of any religious belief, prays to a god in whom she does not believe that if he will spare Bendrix's life, she will break off the affair. Bendrix lives, and true to her promise, Sarah ends the affair. Bendrix and Sarah's husband, Henry, meet by chance one day, many months later, and Henry confides in Bendrix that he thinks Sarah, who is frequently absent from home without explanation and seems to be har harboring secrets, might be having an affair. Bendrix is now convinced that she could not have simply left him to return to her husband and thinks that she must have taken another lover. And so he hires a private detective under the pretext of helping Henry, Sarah's husband, to investigate her infidelities. In the course of things, the detective steals Sarah's diary and gives it to Bendrix, who discovers the truth about why she left him. He also discovers the deep conflict she feels over her promise. Sarah writes in her diary, a vow's not all that important, a vow to somebody I've never known, to somebody I don't really believe in. No one will know that I've broken a vow except him, and he doesn't exist, does he? Yet Sarah's diary also shows that she cannot cast aside the vow. She begins secretly to meet with a man named Smythe, who can only be described as an evangelist for atheism, in an attempt to have him convince her that there is no God, and that she can forget the vow with a clear conscience. But his arguments against God's existence, by their very vehemence, only seem to further convince Sarah of God's reality. How could one so deeply hate someone who doesn't exist? Bendrix realizes upon reading the diary that Sarah still loves him, and he sets to winning her back for this new rival, God. Just as he is on the brink of persuading her to leave her husband and go away with him, Sarah develops a lung infection and dies. After her death, he receives a letter from her, delayed in its delivery because it was misaddressed. 
The letter tells him that she can't be with him. She reveals that she had been speaking with a priest and was seeking to become a Catholic. She writes, I've caught belief like a disease. I've fallen into belief like I've fallen into love. At Sarah's funeral, her mother reveals to Ben that Sarah had been baptized into the Catholic Church as a small child. Bendrick scoffs at the idea that this meant anything. You can't mark a two-year-old for life with a little bit of water and a prayer. The story around Sarah gets even stranger, though, when Smythe, the rationalist preacher, who had fallen in love with Sarah, as everybody in the novel seems to do, is suddenly cured of a disfiguring birthmark when he sleeps one night with his face pressed against a lock of hair that he had snipped from Sarah's dead body like the relic of a saint. At the end of the novel, Bendrix grudgingly believes in God, even though he hates God for taking Sarah from him and making her a saint. Now, I've recounted the plot in more or less chronological order, but one of the narrative techniques in the story is to begin in the middle. The opening line of the novel is, a story has no beginning or end. Arbitrarily, one chooses that moment of experience from which to look back or from which to look ahead. The actual beginning of the novel after the affair has ended, when Bendrix encounters Henry by chance and seeks to discover who Sarah's new lover is. We, as readers, do not initially suspect that Bendrix's rival is not a man, but God. We hear from Bendrix his retrospective account of the beginning and end of the affair, but it is only around the midpoint of the novel that we discover the real reason Sarah has left him and the true nature of Bendrix's rival. This beginning in Media Res captures, in a way not unlike Augustine's retrospective narrative in The Confessions, a sense of the difficulty we have knowing what is really happening in our lives. People thinking that they are doing one thing when in fact they are doing something else. Bendrick seeks to uncover Sarah's lover and finds himself face to face with God. Smythe seeks to disabuse Sarah of her faith and is making her only more convinced. Sarah's mother has her baptized as a child as an act of spite directed at her non-believer husband and set Sarah on the path to holiness. The characters in the novel clearly make choices, but they know neither the full context nor the future consequences of their choices. So one might surely say that they act freely, making choices, but this in no way suggests that they are in control of the outcome of those choices, which seem to be in the hands of God. In this way, Grimm severs the link of freedom and control. And perhaps in doing so, he makes freedom less attractive to us. Since, after all, if Augustine is right, it is not really freedom most of us want, but control. And I think this, in turn, might cast light upon the psychology of Henry Scobie in the heart of the matter. The only character in the novel who does seem free is Sarah. Green puts into the mouth, the mouth of Bendrix what uh, one can only suspect are words reflecting Green's own view as an author. Bendrix writes, the saints, one would suppose, in a sense, create themselves. They come alive. They are capable of the surprising act or word. They stand outside the plot, unconditioned by it. But we have to be pushed around. We have the obstinacy of non-existence. We are inextricably bound to the plot, and wearily God forces us here and there according to his intention. Characters without poetry, without free will, whose only importance is that somewhere at some time 
We help to furnish the scene in which a living character moves and speaks, per providing perhaps the saints with the opportunities for their free will. What Bendrix doesn't say here, but which I think Green believes, is that the reason the saints are free, the reason that the saints come alive as characters in the plot God is writing, is that they seek not control, but the alignment of their freedom with God's freedom. Willingness to let God write the story. This, and not control of the outcome of their lives, or the ending of the story, is where true freedom is to be found. Graham Greene was undoubtedly a bad Catholic. He was also, by all accounts, a human being, selfish and sometimes cruel. But he was also an extraordinary writer, and one who understood the Catholic faith even if he himself failed rather spectacularly to live it out. In these three novels, he shows us important truths about the nature of freedom. In The Power and the Glory, we see how it is precisely that which we cannot change that can have the capacity to free us from the dreary regimen of peace. In the heart of the matter, we see displayed the inner life of one whose freedom is so conditioned by a pride masked as virtue to ultimate despair. And in the end of the affair, we discover that the only true freedom is the freedom of the saints who let God write their story. Almost like a character in one of his own novels, Green was a flawed human vessel who bore important divine truths. Thank you. And maybe we can have time for questions and discussion. I take it that he was saved and that he is a saint. Is that what you intend to convey? Well, <laughs> I, I think um, I think Green thinks that. Um, I think uh, he has he has a, a remarkable scene where the priest, the night before he dies, um, is right to try and. he says is, you know, that it is so hard to know your own heart, that the act of confessing, you know, that the ability of another person to untangle the knots that we tie ourselves in um, is, uh, is irreplaceable, right? But at least it seems to me that the, the whiskey priest's own recognition of his inability Um, and need for a forgiveness that he doesn't really believe he can have. Um, I would say at least there's hope for the whiskey. Well, maybe not. He might be, you know, in that outer purgatory of, of Dante's where the people who, like, you know, mutter the name Mary as they're bleeding out in a river, you know, get to go for thousands and thousands of years. Maybe that's where he is. Um, but I think... Uh, I, yeah, I like to think that there's there's hope for the whiskey priest. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, based off of how you're explaining Graham Greene um, and just a few stories, um, in a way, could you say that these three novels are almost a case of um, an apologia for Graham Greene trying to almost justify his own life um, through reflection of these three characters? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, uh, I think certainly uh, the end of the affair, I think, uh, Graham Greene himself was actually carrying on a long-term affair in the midst of it, and he actually dedicates the book to the woman he's having an affair with, uh, just her initials, but we all know who she was. Um, and... Uh, so I think there is some kind of self-justification on, on some level, but 
part, I think, you know, Green knew what a bad Catholic he was and probably what a bad person he was. Um, and uh, I think in some ways, if there's a character he identifies with most, it's probably Scobie. And he at least professes to think that Scobie went to hell. Um, <laughs> Or at least we cannot say, you know, we, we cannot safely assume that just because Scobie was motivated by what he thought of as love and pity, that 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 was sufficient, right? Um, and he somewhat regretted having the priest at the end kind of offer these hope, hopeful words about God's mercy, because so many people had been so captivated by Scobie and his dilemma that they just grabbed onto that. And I think Green kind of regretted that. So I think... If, if, I mean, I think in some ways he identifies with Scobie. I think he also identifies not so much in, in the end of the affair, not so much with Sarah, the saint, but with, with Bendrix, the author, right? And at the end of the novel, Bendrix believes there's a God. He just hates God, right? And I don't know if Green hated God, but it was not a healthy relationship. <laughs> so... Friends who are so turned off by Graham Greene as a man that they can't bring themselves to enjoy the novel. So they're committed right. to Catholic, but they're, not, are, um, they're worried about it. Um, and I'm wondering, um, from a kind of devil's advocate perspective, right. is there anything that is theologically dangerous about these books, do you think, for maybe particularly for like a young person who's, this is how they learn about Catholicism? Well, it, um, there, there is a, a story, at least, that um, when The Power and the Glory was published, that uh, Green was read the riot act by what was then called the Holy Office, uh, the Holy Office of the Inquisition. But, um, but then later, in the 1960s, in a personal audience with Pope Paul, Paul just said, oh, don't worry about them. I think your novels are great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, interest, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Green was was very close friends with the other great 20th century English Catholic novelist Evelyn Waugh, and Waugh uh, thought that that Green was actually a pretty good theologian, even if he was a terrible Catholic. Now I don't know if it's possible, um, but uh, Waugh didn't seem to find Green's books theologically problematic. He he thought that um, I I do think. Though it could it it could foster in a, someone in someone a sense of a a kind of a bohemian Catholicism in which moral teachings don't really matter, right? And in fact, here here's another great example of um, what a terrible person Green was. Um, uh, a a a woman read Power and the Glory and was so captivated by she decided to convert to Catholicism, and she wrote to Green, who she'd never met, and asked her godfather. And so uh, he agreed, but he said he wouldn't be able to be there at the ceremony, so he was going to send his wife Vivian to actually be his proxy. Um, and Vivian met this young woman and uh, her husband, and they you know, became friends, and so the two couples became friends, and Green eventually had an affair with the woman. In fact, she's the one he, he dedicated the end of the affair to. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, uh, and I, you do kind of wonder whether the uh, the deep, the deeply flawed people that he depicts, uh, not just in these novels, really in all his novels. I mean, the, the characters are almost always deep, deeply flawed human beings. I think there could be. So it's not so much a, I think, a theological or a doctrinal problem. Because uh, I think he's pretty careful like, that kind of revels in the wretchedness of the human condition, right? Um, uh, so, um, I mean, I was I was convinced partly by reading The Power and the Glory. I thought, like, wow, this is the religion for me. If, it can, if there are people who can put God on men's tongues, that's the religion for me, right? <laughs> um, and I don't think I've, uh, I mean, my wife, can tell you life since <laughs> I, I don't think I have. Um, I, 
I guess I could see how that would be, but I think this is a, a really, this is a, this is a all the time in the um, uh, or even in the, I mean, frankly, even in the lives of theologians, right? We, we seem to, you know, be constantly beset by the moral failings of theologians or frankly, uh, the life of the clergy, right? I mean, I sometimes think, you know, one of the biggest problems these days in thinking about the power and the glory is that it's got such a strong account of of the sacrament of orders, right? With the, the whiskey priest at one point says, it wouldn't matter if every priest in the state was like me, right? Because we can still take away men's sins, right? We can still put God on their tongues. And, you know, when you discover that the, that the childhood parish had been abusing, you know, children, uh, does that take away the power of the homily that moved your heart, right? I mean, it kind of does, but it kind of doesn't, you know what I mean? Um, so I think actually uh, the questions raised by the power and the glory have only become more difficult in the last 20 years, right? Um, when it's seeming, you know, there's, there's a lot of clay feet out there. <laughs> And romanticizing the clay feet could also be a problem. Right. That's a kind of a rambling answer to your question, but that's uh, what I got. We don't have time for any more questions, but oh. uh, I rambled too long. I'm sorry. I apologize. No, you're totally fine. <laughs> uh, just a few closing announcements. Um, we are going to be having a reception that's going to go until eight o'clock. And so, if you do have a question, just as soon as the event's over, just like rush. So it's just not going to be featured on the live stream. Um, you're still more than welcome to ask it. Um, um, uh, we love co-sponsoring events with, with the Domestic 2 um, every fall and winter. Um, it's something we really look forward to doing every year here at AIC. Um, we have two events coming up next week, uh, one featuring George Weigel on his new book, and the next is immigration hall, um, that's going to tackle the current immigration crisis that we're facing today. So I highly encourage you to, to come. Um, and can't come to watch the event on our website. Um, if you are unfamiliar with the CIC, if you're a new face, uh, or unfamiliar with the Domestic Institute, um, you heard a little bit about both of us today, but go to our website. Um, they're full of, or chock full of resources, and we'd love to be able to take advantage of them. That's why they're there. Um, thank you again so much for coming, and have a great night. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Around for a while, you don't need to.